Hello, this is Angela, one of the hosts of Journeys of Hope, and I'm standing here on the grounds of Pilgrim Center of Hope. Guiding people on Journeys of Hope is our passion, and as a nonprofit organization, we couldn't do it without you. Today, I'd like to thank our generous sponsor who made this podcast possible in honor of Valentin, Nicholas, and Francisco Campos. Journeys of Hope, an introduction to the universal church that promotes an attitude of pilgrimage among the faithful by introducing you to pilgrim destinations around the world. Welcome to Journeys of Hope, your spiritual passport to holy sites, placing you in the footsteps of Jesus Christ, the Virgin Mary, the Apostles, and the Saints. And by placing you at a holy site and exploring the Christian pilgrimage experience, we hope to define what our daily lives as Catholics are called to be. Journeys of Hope is a weekly series produced by Pilgrim Center of Hope. It's an evangelization ministry. And we invite you to visit us. We're located in Northwest San Antonio. Uh, however, you can visit us from anywhere in the world through our website, where you will, be, you will find a good introduction of our ministry at pilgrimcenterofhope.org. I'm Mary Jane Fox, and welcome to this program. And I'm Deacon Tom Fox, and both Mary Jane and I are directors of the Pilgrim Center of Hope. We have 30 years of experience of leading pilgrimages to the Holy Land, Italy, Spain, Greece, and numerous Marian sites. And we hope that our insights will bring spiritual blessings to you as we take you on a journey of hope. During today's episode, we will take you on a pilgrim journey to the hill country of Jerusalem in ancient Palestine, the Holy Land, uh, to a holy site marking the birthplace of John who baptized Jesus. There we find a church that was constructed on the site of his parents' home. And of course, his parents were Zechariah and Elizabeth. This village located outside of Jerusalem is surrounded by hills and a valley, and so is called the hill country of Judea, as, as we read in the scriptures. It's here where Elizabeth gave birth to John. And Elizabeth was the cousin of Mary, the mother of Jesus. That's right. And it is also here in this village where Mary visited her cousin Elizabeth. As we read in the Gospel of Luke, this was after she had heard from the Archangel Gabriel that Elizabeth was six months pregnant. Mary left Nazareth to be with her cousin Elizabeth, and this story is recorded in the very first chapter of the Gospel of Luke. Well, when Mary arrived at Elizabeth's home, Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, and it was then that the infant leaped in her womb. Well, the infant in Elizabeth's womb was John who was the cousin of Jesus. Well, we know both both Mary and Elizabeth during this time of visitation were with child. It's an interesting, beautiful uh, scripture story, and it is called The Visitation. Well, let's look at this. 2,000 years ago, people lived in homes hewn out of rock, often called grottos. Well, the home of Zechariah and Elizabeth is like this as well. But well, today, as Tommy had said earlier, a Catholic church is now constructed over their home, which also marks the birthplace of their son, John, who became known as St. John the Baptist. And it is today under the care of the Franciscans of the Holy Land. Well, the church is built of limestone. It's also known as the Church of the Nativity of St. John, which is an interesting you know, name of a church, but where else do you hear about a church's name with the word nativity incorporated in the name? Well, that of Jesus' birth. That, uh, in fact, the church in Bethlehem is called the church of, Na- of the nativity of Jesus. And so as we uh, look at the church, we see that it's uh, uh, square-shaped. The main altar is made of marble, and there are two statues that are prominent in the main sanctuary uh, which are quite unique. The one on the left is Zechariah holding a censer, uh, since he was a priest and offered incense in the Temple of Jerusalem. And the one on the right is Elizabeth, which uh, she, as she's depicted as an elderly woman. And you never would expect to see those statues there, Tom. When we first walked in and saw those, and after that numerous times during our pilgrimages, I'm always each time so amazed because you don't see statues like this anywhere else. And I've never seen them in any other Catholic church. 
So um, these are quite unique statues. So let's hear more about the yeah. church. Um, of course, they're unique to the, to the location. That's right. And then it's to the left of the altar, you go down, uh, there's steps that lead down into the grotto, part of, the, uh, of this location. It's identified uh, as part of their home in John's birthplace. And at the bottom is a marble plaque with the uh, Jerusalem cross in the middle. There's Latin inscription around the, the plaque, uh, which says, Here was born the precursor of the Lord. In Latin, cursor domini natus est. It's interesting to note that the Latin word for here is hic. And this word can be found throughout the Holy Land in various shrines telling us the authenticity of the site. As pilgrims, when we reach the bottom, we kneel and bend forward to either kiss the center, uh, which marks the birthplace, or we touch it and ask for the intercession of St. John the Baptist. Uh, we've knelt and kissed this marble plaque uh, marking the birthplace of John, and we ask, too, that we might have the grace to be proclaimers of the good news, yes, yes. which, of course, it should be the prayer of, of every, every Christian. Christian. That's why we, we are baptized. When we are baptized, we are commissioned uh, to be sharers of the faith so that we pray, proclaim the good news of Christ throughout, through uh, our lives, our actions, and our words. You know, that's a pretty powerful experience, what you just described, and I remember doing that. Both, you know, a lot of pilgrims, when they, when they actually kneel down and, and bend over, you have to kneel and bend over into this area marking the birthplace of John the Baptist to either touch it or kiss it. We, we prefer to kiss it. You know, it's when you venerate, when you see something holy, you know, you kiss a cross, or maybe you, if you see a statue of the Blessed Mother or Jesus, and don't you touch the feet of the statue or something people kiss, it's a, it's a, it's a, form of veneration. Well, we, we kissed this marble plaque, and I remember as I did, I thought, wow, I, I just can't believe I'm here <laughs> kissing the very place where this the cousin of Jesus, John the Baptist, was born. So um, anyways, as we walk outside the church, there's a courtyard with the canticle of Zechariah in various languages on ceramic tiles, and we do find it in English. We will explain the significance of the, of the canticle of Zechariah in a moment. But this is really, indeed, a holy place. It's the birthplace of the precursor of the world, of the Lord. Well, let's look at his, his feast day. His feast day in the liturgical calendar is June 24th, which really marks his birthday. And the only birthdays, let's think about this, that we celebrate in the church's liturgical calendar are th of three people. They are, of course, our Lord Jesus Christ, December 25th, Mary, the mother of Jesus, September 8th, and John, June, June 24th. Which, of course, speaks to the significance of, 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 of the role. saint and the, the yeah. important role that he, that he played in the salvation plan of exactly, our Lord. Exactly, because you know, Tom, the saints, we celebrate their feast days on the day they die, the day they died or the day they were martyred. So this is quite interesting to have these three. That's why this is so unique. And as you said, Tom, his role so so. Um, important, so vital. You know, John, we, we know, let's, let's talk a bit more about John here. John was filled with the Holy Spirit, and thus he was born already purified of original sin. How do we know this? It tells us in the Gospel of Luke chapter 1. It says, the angel Gabriel told his father, Zechariah, this would happen. And this is the words of the angel Gabriel to his father. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. So already in his mother's womb, he was Filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, in baptism, when we're born, we are born with original sin. It's through the sacrament of baptism that we become a child, a daughter, a, a child of God. And so we are then filled with the Holy Spirit. So, but John was born without original sin and, of course, went on to have a key role in the mission of our Lord Jesus. And so let's learn a little bit more about his parents, Zachariah and Elizabeth. And as we mentioned earlier, they were elder, the elderly parents of John. And according to the Gospel of Luke, Zechariah was a priest who would offer incense in the temple in Jerusalem. Both he and Elizabeth were righteous before God, observing the commandments and, and the ordinances of the Lord. And when the events related in Luke, the Gospel of Luke uh, began, their marriage was childless because Elizabeth was barren and they were both well advanced in years. The Gospel of Luke states that while Zechariah ministered, at the altar of the incense inside the sanctuary 
in Jerusalem, an angel of the Lord appeared and announced to him that his wife would give birth to a son whom he was to name John, and that this son would be the forerunner of the Lord. Zechariah's response was one of surprise. Remember, he and his wife were both elderly and beyond childbearing years. And he told the angel Gabriel, Well, how shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. In reply, the angel Gabriel told Zechariah that because of his doubt, he would be struck dun, dumb and not be able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed. So, it's, so the Gospel of Luke tells the story in order. It's quite, it's, uh, it's all there. And, it's, it's, and so let's talk more about Zechariah and Elizabeth. Yes, yeah, our listeners are now in their senior. A woman past menopause cannot, of course, become pregnant and give birth. But we have Elizabeth's pregnancy with John the Baptist at an advanced age. But you know what I was thinking? I call the words of the angel Gabriel to Mary when she was in Nazareth, announcing the pregnancy of Elizabeth. He tells Mary that nothing is impossible with God. These words need to be resounded in our hearts today. Nothing is impossible with God. And it is proven. It is proven as we just read here, as we just heard from the Gospel of Luke. So when Zechariah went outside of the sanctuary to the temple's outer courts, he was unable to speak. So he returned to his home, and his wife, Elizabeth, conceived. Elizabeth gave birth, and on the eighth day, when their son was to be circumcised, which is according to the Mosaic law, the commandment, her neighbors and relatives assumed that he was to be named after his father, Zechariah. Well, Eliz- no, Elizabeth, however, insisted that his name was to be John. So the family then questioned her husband. And as soon as Zechariah had written on the tablet, his name is John, he regained the power of speech, just like the angel Gabriel had promised. So when Gabriel, when Zechariah could speak, he gave praise to God with a prophecy which later became known as the Canticle of Zechariah, or as the church also names this beautiful praise or this prophecy, the Benedictus. And, you know, it's a very beautiful prayer. I'm going to ask Deacon Tom to proclaim those same words that Zechariah spoke as soon as he was able to speak. Uh, So these are his words as written in the scriptures. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty Savior, born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets, he promised of old that he would save us from our enemies, from the hands of all who hate us. He promised to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath he swore to our father Abraham to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. You, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our Lord, the dawn from on high shall break upon us to shine on those who dwell in darkness, and the, and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. This canticle is found on the ceramic tiles in various languages in the courtyard of the church, and it's also part of the morning liturgy of the hours prayed by all clergy and religious every morning. Every morning, it's beautiful. Throughout the whole world. And that's yeah. why it's called the Benedictus. It's, the, the, it's a morning the, prayer. It's prayer. a prayer of blessing. And, you know, in those words you mentioned, you know, Zechariah mentions, you, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High. So that's why it's a prophecy. He's already prophesying that John shall be a prophet of the Most High and will prepare the Lord's way. So let's look, let's learn a little bit more about John. John was born in his parents' home. We just discovered that. But we read about the preaching of John and when he began began his public ministry in the first couple of verses of Luke's Gospel, chapter 3. And this is what we read. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, the word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region about the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now, the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar is most naturally understood as a reference point of 20 AD. 
And this is important also because Luke suggests that Jesus' ministry began shortly after John's ministry did, which places the likely date of Jesus' baptism date in the year around 29 A.D. or 30 A.D. Mm -hmm. And so Scripture presents us with the uh, the following reasons why... John baptized, why that was his, his ministry as, as precursor of the Lord. He served as the forerunner or herald of the, of the Messiah, as uh, said by the angel Gabriel, saying he was to preach repentance, uh, forgiveness, and, and preparation for the coming of the Messiah, and he baptized with water uh, again for, for re- repentance of sin. And it's easy for us to think of John the Baptist simply the forerunner and herald of Christ, but he was quite famous in his own day. He lived in the Judean desert and would preach throughout the region and attracting large crowds. Imagine walking from Jerusalem to Galilee and then passing the River Jordan and seeing this man clothed in camel's hair with a <laughs> leather belt around his waist. He's looking like a wild man, actually. Well, well sure. I mean, you know, who so, would dress this way and living in the desert? And, and, and then he would, with a loud voice, be proclaiming this, these words that we hear and we read about in the various Gospels. And uh, actually in, in this church, there, there is an icon of John the Baptist where he just really looks like a, like a wild man. Right, he has the long, bushy yeah, hair, and he yeah. has the cam- the, uh, this uh, a sk- a camel skin type of clothing. Yeah, and the skin is I rough. I mean, camel's hair. Yeah, yeah it's been uh, weathered. Weathered look yeah. on his face. You know, So it's, it's quite interesting how icons really help us enter into the mystery of, of what it's about. It makes me want you to think more about John's life. Mm-hmm. And as stated in the Gospels, his diet was... Uh, locusts and wild honey. And he would be heard saying, one mightier than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop and loosen the thongs of his sandals. And of course, that's in the Gospel of Mark. Right. You know, by the way, the wild honey described here is date honey uh, from the date trees in that region. Because of the Judean desert, there are date trees. And of course, they give date and date honey. But, you know, we also read in the first chapter of John's Gospel that John had followers he was instructing his followers about the coming of the Messiah. And when the Messiah would come, he would hope that his followers would then turn to Christ. Well, it happened in the Gospel of John that we read about that, where in the very first chapter, Jesus walks through the desert, and he's walking uh, towards John the Baptist, and John recognizes him and calls out, uh, Behold, the, the Lamb of God! And from, and from these followers they became the first followers of Christ. So this is a very beautiful, one of, one of my favorite scripture stories in the Gospel of John, because immediately they, they, they were obedient to John the Baptist's teaching. They believed him. They knew he was telling the truth. But when the Lamb of God did come before them visually, they knew it was the Son of God, the Lamb of God. They, they left John the Baptist and then began to follow Jesus. It's really quite interesting. So when Jesus came to John to baptize, uh, John to be baptized, John recognized him and said, "It is I who need needs baptism from you." Well, Jesus tells John to baptize him anyway, which he did. And whereupon, what happens? The heavens open, and the Spirit of God was seen like a dove. The voice of God spoke, saying, "This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased." So this was a, a, a confirmation. John continued his ministry after this happened. He continued the ministry of, of being there proclaiming uh, the, the preparation to, of baptism and recalling the baptism of Jesus. So let's hear the very words of John that he spoke to the crowds that would gather around him. I saw the Spirit descend as a dove from heaven, and it remained on him. I myself did not know him. But he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and I have borne witness that this is the Son of God. So can you imagine, John, as we described him earlier, standing and with a bo- with a boisterous voice, but one with conviction and clarity, but one that would you know, it, it attracts you because you know it's truth. 
This were the words that the crowds would hear John proclaim, and it gave testimony to Jesus as Son of God. And we know also that uh, John's uh, preaching got him into got him into trouble that would eventually right, yeah. you know, lead to his death. That he was killed by Herod, one of the sons of Herod the Great. And the gospel portrays Herod as, as a complex man. That, uh, for start, he was a man in an unlawful marriage. At, at some point, he married Herodias, the wife of his brother Philip, and that put him in opposition to John the Baptist, who opposed the union, leading Herod uh, to have to eventually a, arrest John. And although he had him in custody, and uh, although his wife hated John and wanted him dead, Herod had an unusual fascination with this fiery preacher as described in the Gospel of Mark. As it says, Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and kept him safe. When he heard him, it was much perplexed, and yet he heard him gladly. Isn't that it's interesting? Just, even yes. though it was, the, the, the words were conv- convicting him, and, but the words of truth, even, even though they pointed out his faults, uh, he was still attracted. The, the, the truth really compelled him to want to, to want to hear more. That's the power. That, that's the power of truth. And of course, uh, the Holy Spirit uh, present in in John's uh, in John's preaching. And that's right. Yeah. So it's amazing. And then, so, and, and of course, even after John's death, uh, Herod's fascination with John continued. That when he began to hear reports about Jesus. He thought that Jesus might be John raised from the dead, and so he sought to see Jesus for himself. That was a rumor uh, that spread. Remember in the scriptures, who do the people say that I am? Exactly. And some say right. John the Baptist raised from the dead. That was uh, Harold, Herod uh, started that, that rumor. That's right. Mm-hmm. No, it's interesting to, uh, what's, it's what's so beautiful about reading the scriptures and really prayerfully reflecting on them and, of course, studying the scriptures. You know, there's, the Catholic Church gives us these commentaries that we can go on and lean, on, lean upon to, for, to, for, for the truth and for the explanation of the scriptures. So why was John killed? Well, we could say Herod, Herod's wife Herodias hated John with a passion, uh, presumably because he for publicly criticizing her betrayal of her former husband Philip and her marrying his brother. So eventually, after her daughter uh, Salome had delighted Herod with a special dance at his birthday party, Herodias was able to manipulate him into giving the order for John's death by beheading. And it's this really this whole story in the in the Gospel of Mark, where we read this whole incident of what happened, really says a lot about. Um, you know, manipulation, and, and the consequence of sin, really. So Mark in this gospel references the death of John the Baptist with these words, and his disciples, hearing it, came and took away his body and laid it in the tomb. So, you know, I think, Tom, just hearing about John's life and his time in the Judean desert, spending his life, I mean, really just living totally for the mission of as precursor of the Lord is, is something that we need to really ponder and think about more often when we look at our baptism, even when we make the sign of the cross. You know, when we enter a church, Tom, and we place our hands, our fingers in a holy water font and touch the water that's blessed, the holy water, and place it on our forehead and make the sign of the cross. And I see parents do it for their little ones as they're carrying their babies or their children and blessing their children, we need to remember, you know, can these thoughts come to our mind how the, our for, the forerunner, the people before us, our forerunners, you know, John the Baptist, the saints, and those who, who, who carried the torch of truth and faith before us um, also were, were so convicted with the faith that they would proclaim it as we do when we come in and bless ourselves as we enter the church of God, the house of God, the church. So you're listening to Journeys of Hope, and we're looking at a place in ancient Palestine, the Holy Land, the birthplace of John the Baptist, the son of Zechariah and Elizabeth. And by the way, again, as we heard earlier, Elizabeth was the cousin of Mary, and so John, the cousin of, of Jesus. John was the precursor of the Lord. We've just heard a marvelous, marvelous reminders of the scripture, the stories related in the Bible about this man whose birth we celebrate in the liturgical calendar, June 24th. 
And this is amazing to, to just learn more about John the Baptist. So Journeys of Hope on, um, here we are uh, looking at this, this wonderful topic of, of this man who dressed as camel hair and the leather belt and ate locusts and honey, which, by the way, was date honey from the date trees. We are just going to now look into, after our break, how all of this relates to us today. How, what can we learn from St. John the Baptist? So stay with us, Journeys of Hope. Welcome back to Journeys of Hope. I'm Mary Jane Fox with my husband, Deacon Tom Fox, and we're looking at the, a place in ancient Palestine called the birthplace of St. John the Baptist right outside Jerusalem in the Judean desert. It is indeed an authentic site where today a Catholic church is built over the site and under the care of the Franciscans of the Holy Land. And because of our experience of leading pilgrimages in the past 30 years of groups to the Holy Land, pilgrim groups to the Holy Land, we have visited this site numerous times, and Tom and I have, as we described earlier in the program, have been so honored and blessed as many pilgrims, and maybe yourself have been there, have knelt and kissed or touched the very birthplace of the precursor of the Lord, John the Baptist, the one who was born, who was to be prepare the way of the Lord and baptize with water. So, you know, we've heard a lot about his parents, Zachariah and Elizabeth Tom, and we heard about John and how he died and why he was why he even baptized. But now we're, let's look at what can we take from from this to help us in our everyday lives. What can we learn from John the Baptist? Well, of course, all the scripture is uh, it challenges us to. You know what can we take? You know from from everything that we read in Scripture, it's meant to come alive in us. So what can we take from uh, from John the Baptist that can come alive in us? Uh, well, there's especially uh, two things we can think of: his passion, that um, how he was just uh, his passion caused him to, to live this life in the, in the desert of uh, 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 extreme um, solitude. And, uh, and then, of course, to his message was, was delivered with passion. And then his personal witness, that he wasn't just one that preached, but he was one that lived exactly what, what he preached. He, he lived uh, in, in communion with God. His only purpose was to serve God and then you know the scripture where he, where he says that I must I must decrease so he could increase. And in, in other words, he his total service uh, to the uh, to the Lord. So we uh, that should happen in us too. Um, that we that we as we uh, carry the name Christian uh, close to our heart, it should affect our own personal identity. And and of course, again, we look at uh, at his preaching. His fi- his fiery faith drew people to him through Christ. There's something contagious about a person like that. Maybe you, uh, maybe you've known people uh, like that your, yourself. Uh, maybe you, you've yes. attended a you know a retreat. Uh, maybe at a at a mass, the the priest maybe was so stirred with the Holy Spirit that he uh, gave him a, a, a homily that really really touched your heart. Uh, but that, of course, is that's how God works. He, he works through through individuals, um, and He wants us to be uh, to be inspired by the people that are called into His service. And so, take a be, uh, look back on your own faith journey. Um, yeah, think uh, of the people so, exactly. Think of the people who passionately loved God and how that love inspired you to be open to Jesus and His teachings. And it's really interesting if we do that. We can maybe. Remember someone or an incident that would say, well, I was reminded. And I remember even, Tom, when we were going door to door, remember we had a door to door home visitation ministry years ago. And as we did, we would visit people who would not usually be home. It would be in the afternoon and and here we'd be going door to door and not very many people being at home during the afternoon in certain areas. And so We'd find someone at home and they'd say, this is really strange that you happen to be at my doorstep because just the other day I was thinking about God and maybe coming back to the church. Well, nothing's coincidental with God, but it is, again, those incident, those Christ moments. Uh, John the Baptist certainly provided many of those for the crowds around him. 
And it, it happens still today. So as you were saying earlier, Tom, his passion is something that we can emanate, we can we can also take. And and not to be bold and boisterous like John the Baptist, right? That but to be passionate in our in our love for Christ that we it, it shows without having to even use words. And there might there are times we need to use words. I know um, one of my regular prayers is one of surrendering to Jesus and asking him for his grace and wisdom to lead my day and to help me. Because I know that each day I want to do it my way. You know, I have I have my own plans, and even and and I'm in full time ministry, and yet we we do have responsibilities, and we do have uh, goals and, and deadlines, and it's we ha- we're dealing with time. Time is a reality, but at the same time, we need to be docile to the Holy Spirit, to to be present to God at those moments, and ask Him for that grace. And as I think, Tom, you had made a note one time from the Gospel of Luke how Jesus' words, uh, I have come to bring fire on on the earth and how I wish it were already kindled. kindled. That's a, yes. Uh, and of course, that's a, a prayer that we, uh, that we pray often, but that's, that's God's uh, desire. The fire that, that he wants enkindled, of course, is the fire of love for the Lord. Is the, um, that, and he communicates his love to us in fire. They're like uh, in the... Uh, uh, Divine mercy is like his, his heart is in, on, in flames for us, uh, and and he wants us to uh, to catch that uh, that that fire. Uh, in, in other words, that our faith is not something that we just take for granted, but it is something that influences the the choices that we make. That we are so convinced of God's love for us that is reflected in, in the choices that we make and is inflected, reflected in, in our relationships and reflect, reflected in our, in our attitude and, and uh, what, in, in all that we do. And of course, you know, we, often, uh, we can often fail. It's, it's, it's uh, not likely that for every minute of our life we're going to have that fire consuming us, but, right. we, but we have to have the desire to be drawn towards that. We, that should be a goal that uh, and that uh, and moments that we do experience that that our, our heart being and uh, uh, set afire by the by the love of, of the Lord and then there's going to be our, our times when we may, you know maybe we feel like we're 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 in the desert but God wants those times for us as, as well because He wants us to trust Him even when things are not always uh, uh, as we would hope they would be. Even when, especially when we are challenged, he wants us uh, to put our trust in him and in the grace that he makes available to us, especially through the through the sacraments. But one thing that I, a little uh, habit that I've d- uh, developed uh, over over the years, thanks be to God, is when somebody asks me a question uh, regarding the faith, the first thing I do is I, I ask the Holy Spirit, to "Come, Holy Spirit, help me, uh, help me to answer this question." Um, it, in the in the beginning years ago, it was it d- didn't come automatic, but now it comes automatic uh, because it, it's it, it's become a habit. It doesn't mean that I'm always going to doesn't mean I'm always going to give the right answer, but it does mean that I am asking uh, that f- for the Holy Spirit that I don't say uh, that I don't give an error, that I don't say something that could mislead somebody. But anyway, uh, the fire of, of which John's uh, he, with, with he, the passion with which he lived, there's something for all of us to take from that. that compla- Christianity is not about complacency. Uh, about there's, a, there's an urgency. Right. There is, mm-hmm. It's about an, an, ur- an urgency to live a life close to God because that is where is our greatest hope. Uh, our greatest happiness is in nearness uh, to God. And uh, uh, to get near to God... It may mean that we have to deny ourselves, even as Jesus said, that we must deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow him, that all of us uh, have things that we need to be pruned out of our life uh, to help us to draw closer to God. That might seem like fire as well. That's right. <laughs> a purification. A purification. Yeah. And, you know, purification is all good because our Heavenly Father loves us more than we love our, ourselves. And we, the, the grace that we can ask for is, Allowing Christ our, and our Heavenly Father, God, 
God the Father, Son, Holy Spirit to love us, to love us. And it's just a, a, to, to actually to be docile, as you said, Tom. So we can learn certainly to be passionate, to be passionate. And another thing we can learn is his personal witness. Now, and the, the good news isn't simply communicating faith facts to others. It is a personal proclamation. And of course, as we said earlier, yes, using words when needed. And, but the personal proclamation is, for, is very important, as we can see the role model of John the Baptist. From the banks of the River Jordan, John cried out, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. We are reminded of this powerful witness every time we attend Holy Mass. We hear those words, don't we? We make his words our own words as we gaze upon Jesus present in the Holy Eucharist as the priest holds up the host during consecration as well. Behold the Lamb of God. And we can take those words to heart. And as we do, then we proclaim our lives. Like St. John's own disciples heard this, um, heard this confession repeated later and so consequently followed Jesus. There is nothing quite so powerful as personal witness. And I have to say here, Tom, it, this is something I need to be reminded of. Uh, you know, to many saints have said, look, we can find quotes of saints which are, to me, beautiful jump starters to us to ponder and contemplate the mysteries of our faith. And I remember one saint who said, you know, to even smiling, uh, to walk as if your head is in heaven, but your feet are on earth. And what does that really say? Is you know we're, we are conscious of being a child of God and all that we do at recreation, the choices we make in, in our workplace, but also when we do fail, God in his mercy gives us a sacrament of reconciliation. So on the contrary, the Catholic Church is so merciful. Catholicism is the good news, and Christ is open to receive all. Again, he gives us the foundation of truth that we need to accept. So this is the good news. There's nothing quite so powerful as personal witness when we embrace this. And we constantly encourage Catholics to reflect upon their faith and compose a simple personal testimony to share with others. Tom and I, we do this. We encourage Catholics to, to really write down their, pers- their, their testimony. It helps. And I tell you, uh, to, to do this, it can be done in 100 words or less, a short paragraph, a couple of points, uh, you know, be, uh, your life before Christ, how did you encounter Christ, and now after Christ, the ABC of testimony, we call it. What was your life before you encountered him? You know, I could, some people have said, well, you know, I was angry, I was miserable, I was always upset and worried. Uh, of course, those are part of who we are as human. But then as we encounter Christ, we saw that he carries it with us. He, we, we are united with him in carrying the cross. And then my life now, I'm at peace. In the midst of what goes on, I'm able, my eyes are open, the scales are, are fallen from my eyes as Paul has experienced himself. So your story is important, and it can be life-changing to another. It need not be dramatic. I remember telling my complete life story over a cup of coffee to a priest friend of ours who lives in Philadelphia, Father Ken. And Father Ken looks at me and says, oh, but gosh, I don't have such a profound, dramatic testimony. I just grew up a Catholic, and I wanted to be a priest as I was a child, and here I am a priest. I said, oh, but Father, that's pretty powerful, too, because your parents, you can tell about your, the love of your parents, and certainly my parents loved us, too, when we were baptized as children. But, you know, it's just, this is it. This is what happens when you share and you start opening the discussion. And, and so imagine John the Baptist. I'm sure, Tom, he had these kind of person, you know, similar people would ask him questions. And, and he would be so um, to the point, I'm sure. But at the same time, because of his conviction and love for Christ, it didn't matter how he looked, but the words of, that came from his heart, sincerity, words from his heart, this was his powerful personal witness. Yeah. Well, of course, John, John's story began different than ours in that uh, right. <laughs> when he yeah. was in his mother's womb, well, he, he was filled he, with the Holy Spirit. He leapt, he, he leapt for joy uh, and was filled with the Holy Spirit. But nevertheless, in our baptism, um, we also were, were filled with the Holy Spirit. Yes. We received 
the gifts of faith, hope, and charity. Those gifts were instilled into us at baptism. And those are given to us for as we mature, as, as we take on the Christian life. Um, uh, and it follow, those gifts follow choice. If it's the desire of our heart to draw close to God, then he can... He, he sets up the he sets the path before us. He does. He puts he, he'll bring the he'll bring people into our yes. lives that will uh, that will help us. Um, even he may even bring trials in into our life that are, are that are going to or allow uh, trials. Yes, to to, to uh, purify mm-hmm. us to to see how how serious we are about our faith, but. It has to. Be, there has to be that desire. It's, it, there has to be a choice. At some point in our life, we have to make mature, a, a, a mature choice of choosing Christ as our Lord and our Savior, and uh, and then making a commitment to follow Him as a faithful disciple. That has to happen before we can enter into heaven. So, it, if we uh, if we die before we have made that conviction, and, and but, but we still haven't rejected God, then that's where uh, purification after death happens. That uh, God is not finished with us until we are prepared uh, for the glories of heaven. Uh, um, as, as the scripture says, nothing defiled enters into the, the kingdom of heaven. But the sooner that we make that choice, the sooner is our desire... Uh, to draw close to God, to be his faithful witness, then the better will the rest of our life be. The, it, will, it will begin to shape, it will shape the rest of our life. Um, it will uh, influence all, all the choices that we make. It will influence all of, our, all of our relationships. It will influence the joy that we, and the happiness that we experience. Right, exactly. No, so true. And I think this is, again, why the church gives us, the, the structure she gives us, the guidelines, the foundation. It's beautiful. It's a good news. It's really true freedom. So John the Baptist was really preaching a freedom as well, if we can say. We can learn from him a true freedom. And as we experience freedom, there is passion and there is that personal witness that we can learn from John. I'm reminded of a story of a friend of mine. She was sharing with this uh, the story with me just the other day. Uh, she was out with her husband having dinner at a restaurant, and she says to the young lady who was waiting on the table, the, I, the waitress, the young waitress, um, thank you, and God bless you, may you have a blessed day. So the young girl looked at her, and as if she was startled by hearing those words, walked away but came back and asked my friend, what did you mean by that? Now, can you imagine? I, you know, for us, it's natural. It's perhaps as you're listening as Christians, we're thinking, well, it's very natural. But for me, maybe for those of us who are listening, we're, we're thinking, well, what does it mean? What does it really mean to have a blessed day? Well, the, my friend was really asking God's blessing upon this young girl. She is part of her, her life to very freely express her love for God by asking him to bless the other person which she did in this case with a young waitress. But the young waitress maybe had never heard those words in her home or where she worked or with friends. So she asked, what does it mean to be blessed? And and so my friend explained. And, And I think it was so beautiful to hear that story because I thought how simple, but yet how profound her personal witness of asking God's blessing upon that waitress. How many of us... We can ha- have that opportunity, and we do. We have that opportunity often, and and yes, we miss it. Oh, I do too. But there there are times when we when we do. Doesn't it make us? Uh, I use the word feel. It's beyond feel. But doesn't it make us feel good? Feel in the sense that we are united with Christ, and yes, God, we're praising you at the same time. So it is a, a praise, like the Canticle of Zechariah we heard early in the program. It's also called the prophecy of Zechariah or the Benedictus that the church uses in the morning prayer each morning. His words were that of praising God. Here he was mute because he didn't believe. But once he, uh, his son was born, John, and he was named John, his mouth was, his tongue was loosened and he was able to speak again. And he praised God. 
He didn't curse God. He praised God. And this um, this passion, the personal witness that we're talking about, it doesn't. It's not something that just happens automatically or just naturally. As I said earlier, it begins with a desire, but then we need to uh, develop a discipline of prayer. Yes, we have to be in communion with God. That's what prayer is. First of all, it's is to be in communion. Uh, with with our Lord, so that our Lord can influence us, and we remember that you know Jesus only taught one prayer, the Lord's the Lord's prayer, and just to focus on the different points of that prayer can keep us on track. Um, you know, but one thing he says, "Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven." We want God's will to be done, and if we want God's will. To be done on earth and as it is in heaven, then we're saying we want God's will to be done in my life. And and how can that happen? It it, it happens by a commitment to daily prayer, by worshiping our Lord in the Holy Mass. The most powerful prayer on earth is is the Holy Mass. By frequenting the sacraments, the Lord knows that we are not just naturally going to be able. Uh, to make the the right choices in, in every situation, that we need the help of the grace that's available to us through the sacrament of reconciliation and Eucharist. We we need the help of one another. That you can't be a Christian by yourself. That we need to uh, uh, belong to a faith community where we encourage one another, that we learn from one another, that we pray together, that we learn together. Uh, and you can't, we cannot be a good witness without being good stewards. And of course, we, we talk about sharing time, talent, and treasure. The time is, of course, that's again, the, the prayer, the, the sacraments, the treasure, is that we need to be generous with what God has given us. And, and our talent is, every one of us has been given gifts that are not for us, but they're for our, our faith community. So we need to use those. That's why as we uh, belong to a faith community, we discover those gifts that God has given us for that community to use on behalf of others, not just for ourselves. Right. It's so true. So all this, we have so much to learn from John the Baptist, Tom, so much. He must increase and I must decrease. Those are words that for sure we can take to heart each day. Those are uh, good words to, to keep in our, in our minds. Jesus must increase means that we, he, we accept Jesus as our Lord and choose to be his faithful follower daily. That is the good news. He, he builds on his promises throughout the New Testament that he's always with us. What does it mean that I must decrease? You said it, Tom, to have for free will. Are we uniting our will with his? He has given us the church as the plan, the way, the road to our, our salvation. I read recently a spiritual uh, reading. Uh, it's beautiful about this one person. Was, it was a spiritual reflection. And she said, you know, Jesus is, is, shows us the way, the, the compass. He's the compass. And if we weigh f- from left to right, then we're going off the road towards Jesus. And I like that analogy. And so he must increase, I must decrease. We might use our own different analogies to, to keep that in mind in our everyday life. But it's possible because, again, the Lord knows us more than we know ourselves. And to me, that's a great consolation. I think, oh, Lord, thank you for helping me because you know who I am. And, and I also praise him for the sacrament of confession. And St. Paul reminds us as well, right, Tom? I think you reminded me of this earlier. Uh, St. Paul's words says, he, it is no longer I who live, but Christ living in me. So as baptized Christians, we have a new identity, that of Christ. We become one with and in him. Uh, that is so beautiful. I remember a spiritual director we had years ago. He's now in heaven. Uh, he was fr- as a French priest, uh, Father Philippe. And I, one time I asked Father Philippe, and this was in the very early part of my spiritual journey. I said, Father, how am I to live my life daily with Christ? Um, I, I had some other issues I was talking to him about. It was in my, my previous career, and I was trying to really come back to, I was coming back to the church, and he looked at me straight in the face, uh, straight in my eyes, into my eyes with a smile, and he said, with Jesus, in Jesus, and through Jesus. And I thought, well, that wasn't quite what I was the answer I was expecting. But isn't that it was funny? The right answer, but though. it was the right answer. But you know, isn't that funny how we do expect 
our own expectations, even when we ask questions, we're expecting an, an, the right answer we want. But no, Christ knows us more than we do. And this is, to me, a great consolation I have learned in my journey. So again, you're listening to Journeys of Hope, Deacon Tom and I, Mary Jane. Uh, I We're just so happy that you've joined us. We're talking about John the Baptist, his life, where he was born in the Judean desert and a place not, outside, not far from Jerusalem, the home of Zechariah and Elizabeth. Tom and I have been there. We lead pilgrimages to the Holy Land. We have been to the Holy Land 56 times, uh, friends. If you have, uh, if you are interested, your parish, your, your parish group, an organization, family, uh, just you want to approach your pastor and say, Father, or uh, approach your a deacon or someone in the past and the parish administration office, let's do a pilgrimage to the Holy Land or to a destination that is sanctioned by the church, whether it be shrines of Italy, the Marian shrines of Europe, the footsteps of St. Paul. Tom and I have been to these places, have researched these places. We, uh, You would be choosing well by contacting us at the Pilgrim Center of Hope uh, and finding more information. But go to our website because there is a section on the website dedicated to this unique ministry of pilgrimages with over 30 years experience, pilgrimcenterofhope.org. Yeah, and one of the things that we point out about the, uh, the, the pilgrimages and, and about so many other things that, that we're involved in, that initially when we think of going on a pilgrimage, we may think about, uh, you know, what is this going to be for me um, but a pilgrimage is much is much more than that. There are, one of our mottos is building up the body of Christ through pilgrimages, because the pilgrimages help the whole the whole church. Yes. When we go on pilgrimage, it's, it's an act of it's an act of prayer. It's an act of solidarity with uh, with the people that are that live in, in these holy places and of of the church through the centuries. And uh, uh, spending time on pilgrimage can be life changing. I know it was li- it was for Mary Jane and myself. It it was life uh, yes. li- life changing. So it's much more than uh, traveling to see a, a, a destination and to learn about the destination. It, it is a truly An spiritual spiritual experience that affects the whole body of Christ. Amen. So well said, Tom. Oh, so thank you for that. And that's why it's a unique ministry of pilgrimage. So pilgrimcenterofhope.org. We can help you. We certainly can guide you. And uh, so again, we, uh, Journeys of Hope, we're here uh, every week to give you a introduction, to take you to a, a spiritual passport, to a destination that's very uh, unique, interesting, where we can connect with our everyday life. The jewel for the journey We'd like to give you a jewel for our daily journey this week. It is from Benedict XVI, and these are his words. Celebrating the martyrdom of St. John the Baptist also reminds us Christians in our own times that we cannot give into compromise when it comes to our love for Christ, for his word, for his truth. The truth is the truth. There is no compromise. The Christian life requires, as it were, the martyrdom of daily fidelity to the gospel, the courage, that is, to allow Christ to increase in us and to direct our thoughts and actions. Oh, so beautiful. This must be something to ponder for a long time. And the jewel for the journey, by the way, on each journey of hope are found on the Pilgrim Center of Hope website, and you can archive all of our programs, we have podcasts as well. So tell your family and friends, spread the word. We need to introduce people to some of these beautiful places that are, by the way, are owned by the Catholic Church. So that means that you, dear friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, it belongs to you as well because yeah. it's all part of who we are as the family of God. I, I think that, that one thought is something that, that we should ponder every day, that Christianity is a call to martyrdom. Well, yeah. <laughs> Christianity is a call to martyrdom. And Jesus said that we have to deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow him. If we're not willing to deny ourselves, then we're never going to be able to carry the cross that, that the Lord has designated for us. So deny ourselves is, a, in a sense, is a, a little bit of, of martyrdom. But yeah, just that word. Christianity is a, is a call to martyrdom, isn't it? 
it's not something that uh, that we take lightly. Yeah, and I'm sure parents can certainly li- they live this in their in their vocation of parenthood, the vocation of marriage, and even in the single life, uh, we all experience this. Benedict the Sixteenth, our previous Holy Father, he certainly had these words of wisdom for us. Again, found on PilgrimCenterOfHope.org. So again, we'd like to just um, invite you to visit, do visit us, pilgrimcenterofhope.org. Visit us in Northwest San Antonio in our building that is also has a chapel with the Blessed Sacrament. Our staff would be happy to welcome you and to give you a tour of the Pilgrim Center of Hope. Um, our pilgrimages, again, are quite unique, and they're customized and organized to emphasize the importance of experiencing the places in a relaxed and reflective manner. And so here we are serving you for over uh, 26 years now, since 1993, Pilgrim Center of Hope was founded to help serve people and to help them encounter Jesus in our everyday lives, wherever we are, so that he can give us hope and a new life. So, Tom, I, Dick and Tom, would you close with prayer, please? Oh, God, you raised up St. John the Baptist to prepare a perfect people for Christ. Fill us with the joy of possessing grace and direct our minds in the way of peace and salvation. As St. John was martyred for truth and justice, grant that we too may energetically profess our faith in you and lead others to the way, the truth, and eternal life. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being with us on this Journey of Hope, production of Pilgrim Center of Hope. We are here to guide people to Christ and the church. We are a nonprofit ministry. We welcome your donations. Every bit helps. Visit our website. You can donate online or by calling us at 210-521-3377. That's 210-521-3377. We welcome your donations. Because we are a pilgrim people, always remember to live your journey with hope. of Hope, a production of Pilgrim Center of Hope, guiding people to Christ. Visit our website at pilgrimcenterofhope.org.